Good morning, and welcome to the fourth in this Texas System of Care webinars. Our webinar this morning is Moving Toward Trauma-Informed Systems of Care. I'm Steve McKee with the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health at the University of Texas at Austin, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The webinar series is designed to enhance the state's readiness for system of care expansion, and is made possible through a statewide system of care expansion planning grant Achieving Successful Systems Enriching Texas, or ASSET. Today, we will be learning from four leaders in the field, Dr. Molly Lopez at the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, Sherry Hammock at the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, Lena Zettler from Chil Cook's Children's Medical Center in Fort Worth, and Shalonda Brooks at the Pelchin Children's Center in Houston. Together, these experts will introduce us to the application of trauma-informed systems of care. Some of you have participated in our webinar series before, and to you, welcome back. If you are new to one of these, I have some guidelines I'd like to cover that should make your participation more enjoyable. It'll also give us some valuable feedback to improve our series. First, Please note that you can post questions for the speakers in the chat pod. That's right in the middle of the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> and speakers will respond either in the chat dialogue or I will prompt them to reply following their presentations. We look forward to your questions during the webinar. Uh, you should note the Twitter feed and you can join our online discussion with hashtag trauma-soc. And the Twitter Connect uh, box is in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Also, please remember that you can download all the materials discussed during the broadcast from our website, texassystemofcare.org, and I believe we provide you a link to that. And then finally, and this is important, please make sure to link to the post-webinar survey and complete it prior to ending the session. It should only take about two minutes, and it will provide us with some valuable feedback. The uh, webinar today uh, does qualify for uh, CEUs for those of you that want those, but to get those you'll need to complete the demographic portion of the survey and then you'll be able to download uh, the CEU certificate upon completion of the survey. So again, welcome and we're going to start the series uh, today with perspectives from Dr. Molly Lopez who will introduce us to the what and why of trauma-informed system of care. Molly? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning, and we're going to talk a little bit about why um, trauma is important and why we should be thinking about trauma-informed systems. So to start off, let's make sure that we have um, a shared understanding of what we mean when we talk about a traumatic event. Um, a traumatic event is one, is a significant negative in, event in which um, a person perceives threat to their own safety or to the safety of others. And, and such an event overwhelms the person's coping capacity. When we think about what's a trauma, we should think about it in terms of a child or an adolescent or an adult's developmental level and think about how their own perception may be impacted by their developmental level. Um, as an example, sometimes people will um, incorrectly assume that young children cannot, um, cannot experience a traumatic event because they may not remember it or have words to put it into context later. But that's untrue. Even for very young children and infants, um, an experience can be perceived as, um, as threatening their own safety. And even though they may not explain that in words the way we might, um, it still can be um, experienced as a traumatic event. So just as a few examples of things that are common traumatic events, um, we frequently think about physical abuse, sexual abuse, and domestic violence within the home. Um, we may think about community violence or witnessing violence um, within our neighborhoods or schools. Um, traumatic loss, the loss of a loved one in a traumatic and unexpected way can be a, a trauma event, as well as accidents, injuries, animal attacks 
um, and natural disasters as we've seen recently with Hurricane Sandy. So those are, are, are just some of the traumas that we think about when we talk about traumatic events that may happen to children and youth and families. If you take nothing away um, from my part of the presentation today but this, um, I think this is really a very important piece. Um, when we talk about children and adolescents, we should realize that one out of every four children and adolescents have experienced a significant traumatic event. So in our schools, in our churches, in our um, after school programs, we need to be aware that, um, that of those children in our communities, one out of four has experienced a significant traumatic event. So the prevalence is very, very high. And a few other facts to bring this to home, when we think about other service systems that children, um, that we may be working in and that children may be seen in, trauma is even more prevalent. So within the juvenile justice system, trauma experiences are really almost universal for both boys and girls, um, with estimates as high as 93% and 87% for, for girls. Within the child welfare system, really almost by definition, children have experienced um, one or more traumatic events, frequently multiple traumatic events, and as high as 50 to 75 percent of those children have exhibited symptoms and require some sort of mental health intervention. Another important fact to realize is that the experience of a traumatic event actually increases the risk for children to have multiple traumatic events. And so many of our children who've experienced a traumatic event have actually experienced multiple events over their lifetime. And this is, has a significant impact on them that we'll talk about um, some more in a minute. Um, we frequently have heard about what we call the stress response. And this is a natural response that we all have to something that we perceive as a stressor. And during such a time, we will have an increase in our biological preparedness um, to respond to that stressor. And we frequently think about this as the flight, um, fight, or flee, sorry, fight, flight, or freeze response um, that, that we might experience um, in response to a stressor. So our body is preparing itself to either fight and protect itself to get away and protect ourselves, um, or to freeze and hopefully lessen our, our risk of being hurt. And so as a part of that biological response, um, our, our system changes and adjusts. During that time, we have a surge in adrenaline, in epinephrine, and in cortisol. Our metabolism increases so that we're able to, um, to respond more quickly. Um, our heart rate increases, and we're breathing faster. Um, our blood sugar is coursing through our body, again, to give us energy and strength to react. And our blood pressure increases. And all of those systems getting prepared to handle the stressor um, also leads to suppression of some other systems that are important. Um, because we're getting ready to, um, to fight or to flee, our systems that are not necessary for that process will be suppressed. So important systems that, that are suppressed are um, our immune system. So our immune system isn't so necessary if we need to respond immediately. Um, and it will lessen its response. Um, another important system is our high order cognitive processes. So what we think of as sort of our frontal lobe um, activities, our, our ability to organize and to plan and to think um, multiple steps um, in the future are lessened because we really need to respond in the, in the moment and immediately. We don't need to be having long-term problem solving sorts of of um, thinking. And so when we're having that stress response, those systems are not working at their, at their optimum. When children have experienced a significant stressor, the normal, the normal um, action for all of us is to have an increase in our arousal, which you can see by the, by the um, slope up in this graph. And then gradually as the as the stressor is resolved and as we are able to kind of ensure that we are safe, that level of arousal declines back to where we started. But for some children who are particularly sensitized to the stressors, frequently by having multiple stressors and very significant stressors, 
that level of arousal doesn't return to the same place that it um, that they might have begun before those significant stressors in their lives have occurred. And they're what we call sensitized. Um, if you think about that, um, the next stressor that they might experience, they're going to be starting with their arousal level really at that midpoint, um, or at least at a higher point than other children who are not sensitized to that trauma. That's going to leave them um, at a quicker response to that trauma, and they may overreact to that situation or be what we call hyper-aroused. Um, they're really starting at that high level of arousal, then if a stressor occurs, they're quick to jump back up to really um, at a level of arousal, arousal that's not hard to manage. And um, there's been multiple studies that have shown sort of this impact. Um, one interesting study that occurred talked about um, if, you, if you wake children who have had significant stressors in their life um, from sleep, and compare them to other children who have not had those significant stressors and do a reading of their cortisol level, of their stress hormone, that those children who are sensitized to stress have higher cortisol levels even with absolutely no stressor in front of them. So it's a biological change that has happened to their system. Um, we also need to think about the role that reminders play in, in children who are sensitized who've had significant traumas in their life. Those traumas are frequently, the memories of those traumas are frequently stored in um, the brain in a, in a different way than some of our other memories. There's less verbal content associated with that and more senses associated with it. So there, it's stored in ways um, that are impacted by the sight, by smell, by taste, and by feeling. So what were they experiencing at that moment of the trauma? And so reminders of those experiences um, something sounding the way it did during the traumatic event, um, a, a, um, a, a quick vision that maybe reminds them of that event, or even a feeling that they had during that event. When that comes back to them, that can bring that arousal level back up to that distressful level um, that they felt during the traumatic event. Um, so those reminders are cues to them um, that they're not safe anymore and will bring their level of arousal back up, even if the environment, the context, does not support that there is a significant um, safety concern at the time. Um, so, for example, you might hear children who um, have experienced sexual abuse who will talk about the sound of a door closing, the sound of footsteps in the hallway, or just the mere fact that it's nighttime, and that's when it might have occurred as a trigger for them and as a way that that arousal and that, that um, distress comes back up. Um, real quickly, these are the common symptoms that we think about in terms of traumatic experiences. We think about um, having intrusive recollections, nightmares, and flashbacks. We think about avoiding reminders of, of the event. We think about numbing or, um, or sort of shutting down of those emotional responses in order to deal with with the distress. And we think about hyperarousal, um, which will show up as, as um, jumpiness, um, startle response, and um, difficulty managing um, emotional arousal. Um, but what we really need to remember is that only about 3 to 15 percent of children who've experienced a significant trauma meet full criteria for PTSD. And although many might describe some of these symptoms, they're certainly not the only symptoms and the only negative um, responses that youth may have as a result of a traumatic event. This next slide talks about um, a study that was done in preparation for um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And adults were interviewed um, who had experienced trauma um, in their life, um, both early in their childhood, before age 14, and then as adolescents between age 14 and 18. And then also there was a group who had experienced a disaster-related um, trauma. And what the researchers found is that there was a wide range of symptoms that were endorsed by individuals. Things like difficulty managing affect, um, experiences of anger, um, suicidal ideation, um, risk, risky sexual behaviors and risk-taking, um, 
guilt and, and feeling like nobody can understand um, what they've experienced. And these were common symptoms that were experienced, especially by those individuals who had early trauma experiences in their lives. And so when we think about what trauma, um, what role trauma plays as children develop, we need to remember that um, those symptoms of PTSD are one way that trauma can impact children, youth, and families. But really, there's a much broader array of symptoms that can, that can be an impact. And we need to keep that in mind, because those children will frequently show up in our systems and resemble children who have bipolar disorder, who have ADHD, who have conduct disorder, and who have major depression. Um, although those certainly can also be comorbid with um, other trauma-related problems, they can also be a way of, of a child displaying their trauma symptoms and, and sort of mimicking other symptom, symptomatology. Um, it's important to think that trauma survivors and understand that trauma survivors have usually adopted a set of survival skills or coping skills that have really helped them manage um, the events that they've had in their lives. Um, these strategies may make very much sense given what people have experienced, um, but to others they may seem confusing. They may seem um, not helpful and not productive. Um, so some of those types of, of coping skills that we may see are things like substance abuse. Um, there are things like cutting behavior. There are things like avoiding um, avoiding other people um, that may remind them of the trauma. And so those are coping skills for an individual um, in a situation where they have, they have been unsafe and have experienced um, significant events in their life, but they're maybe not helpful for them today. Okay, I'm gonna real quickly touch through the Adverse Childhood Experiences or ACEs study. We're going to go through it very quickly, but you'll have the slides available to you if you want to look in more detail. This was a very large study conducted by the CDC, the Center for Disease Prevention and Kaiser Permanente HMO. Um, they surveyed a very large number of adult members and um, asked them about experiences they had during their childhood that would be considered traumatic experiences. At the same time, they had a wealth of information about those individuals' um, health as well as surveying them about um, their overall sort of functioning in daily life. This is really one of the major studies that brought to the awareness um, of a large scale of people that neglect and abuse and trauma is very, very, very common um, for individuals. Um, so rates of, of some of these various types of traumas ranged from 6%, really up to 28, 30% of the individuals who they surveyed. They also found that the number of traumatic events that an individual experienced while they were a child had significant impacts on their health and um, their development. So here's a range of some of the neurobiological impacts that were found as a result of childhood trauma experiences, health risks that were found um, that increased the more trauma experiences individuals had had. Um, it also increased individuals' disease and disability as adults, so increases in heart disease and autoimmune disease and a range of other significant diseases. And also increased individuals' risks of social problems, including homelessness, um, inability to sustain employment, criminal behavior, et cetera. It really raised people's awareness of the, of the significant public health concern that early childhood trauma experiences had resulted. And this is sort of the model that they developed to um, highlight that. So let's uh, switch now to talking a little bit about what we mean by a trauma in, by trauma-informed care or a trauma-informed system. So a trauma-informed care is one in which um, it incorporates proven practices into current operations to deliver services that really acknowledge the role that violence, victimization, and trauma play in the lives of the children entering our systems. It, it, it's not a particular type of intervention. It's not a particular type of service. Really, trauma-informed care is a change in the way that we think about the services that we provide and the interventions that we do. 
it's really a paradigm shift. And this sort of is one pictorial way of describing the paradigm shift. It's really moving from asking the question, what is wrong with you, to really asking the question, what happened to you? And it's moving from a system in which the system is in control or the providers are in control of what's going on to a system in which we are collaborating with individuals who have experienced traumas as a part of the way that we work with them. Um, this is uh, adapted from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and really um, defines some of the core components of trauma-informed systems. So trauma-informed systems educate children, families, and providers on trauma exposure, its impact, and treatment. Um, trauma-informed systems go out of their way to make sure that children and families understand the impact of trauma, the prevalence of trauma, and, and understand um, how to recognize if it's an issue. Um, trauma-informed systems engage in efforts to strengthen the resilience and protective factors of children and families. We know that even if children have not experienced a trauma at this point in their life, they are at risk for experiencing a trauma later, and we want to prepare families to be resilient. Um, Trauma-informed systems routinely screen for trauma exposure and related problems associated with that and use culturally appropriate evidence-based assessments and treatments. Trauma-informed systems also address the impact that trauma has on parents and caregivers and the family system. So recognizing that trauma impacts not just a child and a youth, but the entire family system. And trauma-informed systems emphasize continuity of care and collaboration across child service systems. And they also maintain an environment of care for staff that addresses um, and minimizes the risk for secondary traumatic stress. We, we understand that trauma-informed systems cannot really operate without staff that, um, that have the capacity and the resilience to um, manage working with children and youth and families who've experienced trauma. Um, so a few more things about trauma-informed systems. This is sort of um, five of the key components of a trauma-informed system. So trauma-informed systems are, are, think about safety. They want to ensure both the physical and the emotional safety of the children, youth, and adults who are within their system. Um, there's a core belief in trustworthiness. They want to maximize the trustworthiness, making tasks clear, maintaining appropriate boundaries, and really ensuring that there is trust between families and providers. Um, they want to maximize choice, prioritizing child and family choice and control, collaboration, and then empowering families um, and, and utilizing skill building efforts to empower families. Um, we're not going to talk in detail about treatments in my, in my um, section. I know that we'll hear some more later from some of the field. Um, but real quickly, I wanted to put up a list of just some examples of evidence-based trauma treatments, um, including things like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, parent-child interaction therapy, which targets young children, um, seeking safety, which targets individuals who've experienced trauma and have substance abuse issues, et cetera. And some core components of those effective trauma treatments. They focus on the relationship with the caregiver. They recognize, again, the impact of trauma on the family and really bring that caregiver or parent into the intervention. Um, they include psychoeducation on the effects of trauma skills and build cognitive coping skills for you. And they also work on safety planning. In addition, many of the trauma interventions will have some component that will involve retelling of the trauma in an effort to um, reduce the distress that's associated with the reminders of that trauma and work through some of, the, um, some of the beliefs and meanings that trauma might have for the child to make sure that, that's, um, that those beliefs are, are helpful as the child develops and moves forward. Um, so just to close, here are some resources that may be very useful for, for you as you look to understanding how your system and the agencies that you work in may become more trauma-informed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. Uh, that was an excellent presentation and overview. I noticed that we had at least one question in the chat room uh, during Molly's presentation, and we will um, 
invite more of those. If you uh, thought of specific questions during Molly's talk that you'd like to uh, have her address, please go ahead and enter those uh, in the chat and then she will uh, follow up and other uh, participants are welcome to join the dialogue and, um, and interact around some of these questions that could come up. Now um, <clears throat> we're going to look at the application of trauma-informed uh, systems at the state, the community, and the individual organizational level. And to start with that, Sherry Hammack will discuss state-level efforts to advance trauma-informed care. Sherry? Thank you, Steve. And good morning. Um, there's just like three examples from state level initiatives that I'd like to speak to this morning, and I'm sure that there are others um, that are happening today. One is, and you'll see on the slide there, is the trauma informed care initiative that's going at, on at the state level under the leadership of the Department of State Health Services. And this initiative is supported by a federal grant under the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative. So there's the um, goal of this particular initiative is to transfer children's mental health services in Texas into a trauma-informed care system that fosters resiliency and recovery. You know, with this particular initiative under DSHS, the target population is children and youth aged 3 to 17 who are children of military families or have experienced or witnessed trauma. So it can be either, either one of those. The objectives that they're looking at is transforming existing children's mental health services into trauma-informed care through the training of workforce and, and looking at policies and practices, really increasing access to trauma-informed services and treatment, and evaluating outcomes of trauma-focused treatments and, and tweaking those as needed. Also looking at integrating trauma screening practices into the community mental health systems and organizations around Texas. Through those objectives, the way that this will be accomplished is creating two learning communities through a couple of existing community centers, one being the Heart of Texas MHMR, the Heart of Texas Region MHMR Center, and that's around Waco, and there's six surrounding counties there. And so there's a designation from the national level on Category 3 community treatment centers, and so looking at that designation for the Heart of Texas and also for Blue Bonnet Trails, which is around the Round Rock, Round Rock, Williamson County, and there's about eight counties in that area. So those two community centers will serve as laboratories, if you will, to kick this effort off, but really looking towards statewide transformation. So this is going to be accomplished, as, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, through some training, looking at um, trauma-informed care and cultural competence for the entire workforce, looking at TFCBT, which is trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy for clinicians, rolling out some parent-child interaction therapy for clinicians for younger children, and workshops for caregivers, understanding that the needs of children and youth there. An additional strategy will be creating community partners, and those community partners will be participating in referrals of the target population and developing an advisory committee. And then one of the products will be developing a statewide transformation strategic plan, and this is going to be informed by a steering committee and local advisory committees youth and caregiver representatives and stakeholders. And then something you may not be able to read on the slide, at the bottom another activity will be a statewide summit on transformation to a trauma-informed care system. This slide um, shows a little flow chart, and I know there's some words on top of each other's, but again, this just kind of shows the flow of the direct care services at the community treatment the community treatment services centers. And so there'll be a referral that comes in from a community partner into the community mental health 
organization at intake and assessment, and as you can see, they'll be screening with the CANS tool, which that stands for Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths Ad Assessment Tool. And then, as you see, if it's yes or no, then they'll, they'll get plugged in to appropriate assessment and um, tools to address trauma. So that's, that's just a little snippet. Um, for more information about this particular initiative, here is the national resource for the, at the Child Traumatic Stress Network. And then for more information from our state level, um, you see Marisol Acusta at Department of State Health Services. There's her email, contact information, and phone number as well. So that's one initiative. Another one I'd like to touch on this morning is under the leadership of the Department of Family and Protective Services, appropriately called the Trauma-Informed Care Initiative. This particular initiative really talks to um, what Dr. Lopez talked about earlier, recognizing that children and youth that have, have experiences of abuse and neglect could have long-term effects um, as the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experience study indicated. So the need to address this as early as possible will really help in increasing an effective service delivery system. So under this initiative, Child Protective Services has chartered a multidisciplinary work group to further develop the child welfare system in, into a more trauma-informed system of care with, the, of course, the ultimate goal of improving outcomes for children, youth, and families that are served by Department of Family and Protective Services. And here on the slide, you can see the list of identified values that they have plugged in and had thoughtful conversation about in developing this particular initiative. Additionally, um, the vision for this, this initiative is, um, I'm not gonna read this to you, you can read it, but you can note that there's individual components that they're really looking at incorporating a child and family story and the child's developmental level while really plugging in those evidence-based approaches to policy, training, leadership, and, and service delivery. And to accomplish this particular vision, they've, again, thought, thoughtfully thought through um, a mission statement and um, that outlines clear direction, including stakeholder groups that would be included in working through this initiative. And, and I think that that's noteworthy of, of talking about agency staff, judges, therapists, parents, foster and kinship families, residential contractors, child advocates, and Star Health, which is the, the health provider for uh, many of our, or all of our children in the foster care system. So those are some of the stakeholders that would be included in advancing the goals and objectives in this particular initiative. And again, here's the, the four goals with, within this, this initiative. <clears throat> that the, and you'll see some similarity between the uh, public mental health initiative and then the child protective services initiative here. So one of the goals is to, to really reduce the impact of child abuse and neglect and removal of child and youth and family is really to look at using trauma-informed care and treatment to do that. And secondly, to build capacity relating to the use of uh, trauma-informed principles and really through collaboration and partnerships with other systems and providers to increase trauma-informed activities by using data and that's something that is present. I think that, that um, the use of data and evaluation techniques to really assess how the work is going is, is very critical. And then a fourth goal is to foster an environment that promotes wellness and care for staff and caregivers, recognizing uh, that the child or youth does not exist singly, but within a system, a family system, and um, and with the additional supports. So there's been four working subgroups that's been developed, and as you can see here on the slide, one of the work groups is really addressing assessments or tools related to trauma-informed care, and another one around training, 
a third one around caregiver support, and then looking at staff support. So again, that's just a little snippet of that particular initiative. And for four, more information, hot off the press actually, on the DFPS website is more information about the, that trauma-informed initiative. And Claire Hall is a staff person whose email and um, phone number there you can see to find out more information. And the third and final initiative that I'd like to talk a little bit about is the restraint and seclusion reduction effort that's been going on for quite some time. Um, one of the milestones in this particular initiative is in 2005, Senate Bill 325 was passed. And I mean, there's been some subsequent um, legislative initiatives as well. But that particular bill was, was instrumental in setting up a leadership advisory group that has been working together. And it's a cross-section of stakeholders in various areas and various disciplines. And it's facilita facilitated by the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health. And, and the restraint and seclusion effort has really come to see that you, having to utilize restraint and seclusion is a failure in the treatment approach. And so how can this be addressed um, any better than through really developing a, a culture and an environment that is trauma-informed and looks at, at those types of approaches? to reduce restraint and seclusion. So this particular leadership group, as I mentioned, is comprised of state agency leaders, consumers, service providers, advocates, and philanthropists across the state. So this group's been working together for quite some time. And as you can see on this particular shot slide, their vision and mission and long-term goals um, are identified to really address systemic barriers identify best practices. And um, I always appreciate this one because I don't feel like we always build this into our, our um, direction a lot of times, but recognizing and celebrating successful organizational culture change. With that, one of the other activities that, um, that was instrumental with the restraint and seclusion reduction effort <coughs> was a federal grant, a three-year federal grant from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, that targeted three state psychiatric hospitals. And really some of the work that was going on prior to this and that also was delivered in under this grant has transcended to other hospitals around the state, other state psychiatric hospitals and other disciplines, private psychiatric, um, juvenile justice, and um, and all. So this, is, this has been very cutting edge work. And so with that, with that grant, there was some strategic approaches that were really identified that were key in addressing the reduction of restraint and seclusion and creating more of a culture of care under a trauma-informed system. And so one of the strategic approaches that was identified was leadership. It's really you can't move forward unless you have, have you cultivated, committed, and dedicated leadership to address um, doing business differently in a trauma-informed environment. And there's a lot of good strategies along those lines. And then debriefing was another one, um, a strategic approach that if there was an incident around restraint or seclusion, that a technique at the appropriate time post that episode would be debriefing. Or even if there was a near miss, perhaps something was done that was successful that there wasn't a restraint or a seclusion. And going through a debriefing activity with the client and the staff that were involved is very helpful in changing that course so that's not repeated and looking at what, what happened. Third, the use of data, and again, this has come up in, in all three of the initiatives, rightfully so, that we're really looking at data-informed decision-making, but putting data together in a way that is clear and understandable to particular audiences. So for example, if there, if there are direct care staff at a living unit, that they're able to see data and perhaps how many days that they have been restraint and seclusion free, you know, and so really looking at 
a strength-based approach at decreasing that and, and then looking at ways and means of doing that through trauma-informed care and treatment. Looking at data and how that informs your work through leadership practices. So, for example, if there were restraints <coughs> that were happening on a particular shift or um, during a particular day of the week or around a, a time of day, that that leadership and staff can really look at that and say what's going on at that time and address that and really keep things moving forward to, uh, pr to promote recovery and resiliency. The third strategic plan here, or the st strategic approach, is workforce development. And that is always ongoing, looking at, and I think we saw that in, in the other one, is training, training and more training. As we have turnover is really keeping our workforce informed and building capacity. And I know through the STARS effort, a curriculum, Healing Today, Hope for Tomorrow, was developed. And that really incorporated some trauma-informed strategies that looking at what are triggers for the people that we're serving? What are triggers of staff? You know, and, and really taking a critical look and um, at those through that training. Strategies to empower clients. This is one, one particular example of this is really looking at physical environment. So some of the state <coughs> supported psychiatric hospital facilities had looked at converting because they've had such a reduction in, in seclusion, for example, that they've converted those rooms into oasis or calming rooms or comfort rooms and really asking that the people that they're serving there design those rooms. What, what would work? What would be calming to you? And, and setting those up and that being a privilege to, to go in or, or to use those rooms in the form of treatment. And I know some of the juvenile justice facilities have incorporated that as well. And then the last one listed here under strategic approaches is consumer involvement. And so this really paid a lot of attention to peer support specialist and including the role, the, the vital and critical role of using peer support in whether it's debriefing or other ways that those folks are so credible so as far as working with people that we're serving that that, that is a very helpful. They've been there, done that, and um, many times it's, it's a lot more real to listen to someone who's been there. So with that, these are just some of the strategic approaches and I think these ideas and there's a lot more examples that are laid out better in a toolkit that is offered now that, that was developed under that initiative. And on this slide, the second bullet guides you on the place to go to look at that toolkit and see what some examples are um, to develop a trauma-informed and, and create a culture of care. Additionally, the top bullet, again, points to some national, a national resource. And then the bottom one is the Restraint and Seclusion website through the Hogg Foundation really details some of the past presentations and it's a great resource. There's, for example, there's a report about reducing restraint and seclusion within residential treatment centers that the Texas Network of Youth Services had sponsored and, and led. So that report's available at that the third link there. So I think that you can see that through all three of these initiatives that are at the state level that there is certainly some opportunity to collaborate between and amongst those initiatives but there's a lot of common elements as we all become more informed on what trauma-informed care and treatment means and how do we incorporate that into our our practices and policies and training and um, in the way that we do business. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Steve. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, for the statewide perspective and actually um, what a comprehensive look at the three initiatives that are going on at the state level. And so as we go from that kind of macro system level uh, to the community. We're lucky today and fortunate to have um, another ex um, an expert really in understanding how trauma-informed care has been implemented at a broad community level there. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lena and she will join us now. Lena? Well, 
Well, good morning. Thanks well, good morning. for having Thanks me. For having um, Dr. Uh, Wayne Carson could not be here with us today. So I will be representing the committee in Tarrant County that's really looking at how we become a trauma-informed community. To really begin to tell the story, we have to look back about 13 years ago uh, to an incident that happened in our community here in Fort Worth. Uh, it was a weeknight. There was a youth rally going on at a local church and uh, there were about 150 folks there and a adult male came into that church group and uh, he was armed with uh, a rifle and a homemade pipe bomb and uh, killed himself and seven other folks, um, including four teenagers. Uh, seven others were injured. Uh, this man certainly had an untreated mental illness and had had no uh, previous criminal record. And this really became a catalyst for change here in Tarrant County. Our mayor at the time, uh, Kenneth Barr, reached out to Cook Children's and some other mental health providers and sources to really look at what could we do to um, reduce the chance that this would happen again in our community? As a result of that, um, what began to form is a network of agencies and providers called the Mental Health Connection. So initially this was a collaboration of uh, pediatric and some adult uh, providers and community agencies that got together to really look at defining the infrastructure for how we would move ahead. If we look at Mental Health Connection today, we have over 70 participating agencies, um, and that includes private practitioners, family members, consumers, and advocates as well. Mental Health Connection also began to really look at, back in 2006, um, 2007, what our goals and strategic initiatives would be. And decided that one thing we really wanted to do here in Tarrant County is to try to bridge the gap between evidence-based practice, what we know in the research, and what we can actually implement in our practices. So it began a five-year initiative. Uh, every year uh, a symposium was planned that really focused on evidence-based practice, and out of that grew six learning communities. The learning communities met for about six months. They identified policy issues and barriers, and that resulted in implementing five programs, pilot programs, based on evidence-based practice. One of those programs was uh, the Trauma Implementation Team. And the Trauma Implementation Team began to look at um, PTSD and trauma, realized pretty soon um, that there are some initial identification and diagnostic obstacles when it comes to children and adolescents. And I'd refer back to Dr. Lopez's presentation um, indicating that only 3 to 15 percent of children meet the full criteria for PTSD. However, we know that one in four actually exhibit or have experienced trauma. We also, this group also began to really look at the data that was coming in at that time. Um, in 2007, DFPS saw about a 55 percent increase in child abuse and neglect. United Way did a survey that also showed an increase in uh, the perception of violence in the home, the school, and in the community. And then the other thing that was happening at the time um, was post-Katrina, and Tarrant County in North Texas had um, a lot of evacuees from New Orleans. Uh, and then we looked at, in 2006, there were about 26,000 of those uh, children and teenagers still residing in this area. Cooks did a survey at the time. I should say a little bit about Cook Children's. Cook Children's is a system of eight companies. Um, we have two hospital campuses, about 430 inpatient beds, and about 120 uh, neonatal intensive care beds. We also have three urgent care centers and about 500 plus physicians. So we're a pretty large pediatric health care system in North Texas. And in 2008, Cooks really wanted to look at our community, the six counties um, that we serve, and really look at what are the community issues that are going on and how do we begin to really embrace preventative care. And so we surveyed about 7,000, 7,500 families across six counties, 
And some of the results were pretty striking. We found that about five and a half percent of the respondents um, said their children, and these were children in homes um, zero to 14, so it really did not include a good sample of adolescents. But we found about five and a half percent um, had experienced some form of abuse, um, and including uh, a gang threat. And that really boiled down to about 34,000 children across six counties. Uh, we looked at how many in our six counties had experienced a natural disaster or an accident, um, and that was about 40,000. And then finally, we also looked at accidental injury, and these were injuries that required medical attention in the last year, uh, and that was about 94,000. Taking that data into consideration, the trauma informed, um, I'm sorry, the trauma implementation team decided to really pursue TFCBT as an evidence-based practice in Tarrant County. Um, they chose the Cohen, Manorino, and Deblinger model. Um, this was supported by NCTSN. Uh, one of the reasons that it was selected, it had a lot of cultural adaptation. Uh, it included some professional facilitation and supervision. And ultimately, it really brought together about 22 agencies for education and training. And these included hospitals, our CPS workers, Fort Worth Police Department, um, domestic violence service providers, um, and it also included a trauma assessment screening tool. And we engaged in some social marketing and a fair amount of education and training as well. Ultimately, 54 providers or administrators, uh, we knew that it was important not just to put, provide this training for frontline clinical staff, but also to include administrators and executives who are making decisions on policy across 15 agencies. These folks received consultation for nine months. Um, we also engaged in a partnership with um, UT Austin in a study that uh, Dr. Lopez followed up with. Um, and ultimately, we had 85 youth or families enrolled, and then 65 of those were followed up uh, a year later. One of the very important lessons learned from this process was um, a problem that's prevalent for mental health in general, but particularly for kids and adolescents who have been traumatized, and that's the initial intake or access uh, obstacles. What we found was that different agencies engaged intake differently or had a different referral navigation process. So for example, some agencies could only see children who had a C active CPS case or police referral. Um, and then in our case at Cook's, we had some children that would come in at a certain level and be triaged to a higher level of care. Um, and as well, we had some agencies that provided service, services to specialized in specialized settings like group homes, which created access issues. Uh, in 2009, the Mental Health Connection continued the Bridging the Gap Symposia, and that year we really did focus on how we educate um, our community around the issues of trauma. So we had three very key uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Bruce Perry came in and talked about the neurobiological aspects of trauma in the brain. Dr. Cooper, Janice Cooper, came and discussed how to improve our trauma-informed policy. And then I think another thing that was really pivotal uh, was that we really began to realize as a community that there really is an implementation science and that if we really want to bring adaptive change and not just technical solutions to problems, we really need to embrace the science of that. Um, I'll add that we did have a few more lessons that we learned from the TFCBT model. I mentioned the problem of access. Uh, we definitely pinpointed the need for ongoing supervision to ensure the fidelity of whatever model we adapt. adapt. Uh, we did find that the therapist and the agency attitude towards the evidence-based practices were very positive. Uh, we realized, like I said, that we needed to really embrace implementation science to move ahead. Uh, at Cook Children's in 2010, we were also engaging in some um, expansion of our um, way we manage medical trauma. We brought Dr. Kassam Adams uh, from CHOP, from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who did Grand Rounds training for all of our physicians in the medical center. We also engaged her healthcare toolbox 
which you can find that on the NCTSN website. And then we also supported our community by providing a school nurse symposium that focused on uh, supporting the traumatized child. And this included a collaboration between our child life staff, our trauma department, and those in our staff that have been trained in uh, CISM, the crisis intervention and debriefing model. In 2011, um, our community was really ready to look at how we might bring this to the next level. We um, applied for a grant. Uh, we did not receive funding for that. Uh, but there was such a momentum around the issue of trauma that we decided, in spite of the fact that we had not received funding, that we were really going to pursue this. So um, in many communities, you might see some um, disinterest at that point and people being disengaged, but it really helped us to pull together and really engage in a larger conversation. So we went back to our Mental Health Connection membership, which again I mentioned is about 90 agencies, and we had some table discussions uh, around some issues about what does a trauma-informed community really look like, what resources do we have, and what do we need to do <clears throat> excuse me, to get to the next level. The Trauma-Informed Community uh, Committee currently meets, and we um, really felt like we needed to define who we are and what our vision is. And I think we all kind of had a light bulb moment uh, in this committee as we sat initially and s talked about trauma-informed community, I think we all really were thinking of the service provider industry and what we can do for training, evidence-based practice. And the more our discussions continued, the more we realized that this, what we're really after is a community, not just a community of healthcare workers, uh, but a broader scope. So what that required us to do was really broaden our stakeholder base, um, to reflect what we're thinking now of community. So this would be any person that comes in contact with the child that's been traumatized. That would include teachers, certainly would include first responders like policemen and fire department, uh, EMS workers. Um, we certainly wanted to embrace our juvenile justice folks. Um, the other aspect of this is we realized that there are plenty of people in our industry, intake staff, who may not be clinically trained, but come in contact on a daily basis with families and children who have been traumatized. So we wanted to also broaden that community base to that group, as well as include other universities in the area. We began to explore some of our resources that are already out there with NCTSN, realizing we didn't have to recreate the wheel. Um, the group has really served as a networking and resource sharing forum. Uh, we've developed a web page to um, further um, put that information out there to a larger community. And the other thing that I think that was really important about this group is that around the same time we were doing some very intensive leadership training and uh, we brought in um, Ellen Kagan from uh, Georgetown Leadership Program in DC and she did a very extensive uh, year-long training with some key folks within our organization and this really helped our conversations around trauma to be really relevant, very synergistic, uh, very respectful, uh, and I think really helped us move forward. Um, this past year, we were selected as part of the Complex Trauma Treatment Network. Um, Brad Stolbach, who is a psychologist in Chicago and heads up uh, this region, um, provided us technical assistance and um, he was able to provide direct training to three local police departments, to many CPS workers, our mental health connection membership, um, as well as our um, Cook Children's Medical Care team. And that is our um, providers here at Cook Children that deal specifically with doing forensic and medical examinations for physical sexual abuse and neglect. Uh, Dr. Stahlbeck uh, had a site visit where he visited our children's hospital. He visited the board of directors with Mental Health Connection. He was very involved with juvenile services um, and also with the research that's been going on at UT Arlington and at TCU. And this culminated in us participating in a regional conference down in Houston uh, where we brought 15 
delegates, and some of those were including our parent and family partners as well. Other work that we've done in this area, we have participated in uh, TarrantCares.org, which is a very large um, resource. It definitely connects you with local resources in Tarrant County uh, on many topics, not just trauma. Um, it also brings in relevant journal articles. It's really a very broad um, web-based web program. We also created a resource library for professionals in this area who are looking for additional trauma training. And we have engaged our uh, University of Texas Arlington graduate students who are working in social policy and mental health um, to help us do some agency organizational assessments with how trauma-informed we are. We're continuing to explore um, a universal screening and assessment tool, realizing that those are two separate um, goals. We need a screening mechanism as well as a pretty consistent assessment tool. We are going to continue first responder training. Um, Arlington Police Department has expressed an interest um, as well as some of the trainings that Mental Health Connection does, uh, I'm sorry, Mental Health Association and MHMR. Cook Children's is currently involved in a collaborative effort with Trauma Support Systems of North Texas. This allows us to provide a licensed professional counselor that comes into our Cook facility, into our ER, and families that have been identified through our trauma team here, it allows this um, direct service provider to connect with that family while they're here in their hospital stay, to invite them to support groups, but it also allows us to follow these families through our home health and child life staff so that if the child is, um, you know, discharged from here six months, there'll be a follow-up visit. Um, as we know, a lot of times the trauma uh, symptoms may not pre present initially, uh, but over time you may see an increase in those symptoms. So this allows us to, once we've targeted a family that has had uh, medical trauma, physical abuse, whatever, to really follow that uh, person with some ongoing care. Cooks also um, does a trauma conference every year. This past year, we just had one in September. We had about 110 folks uh, participate in that. We have continued in this community to promote and support the Manorino trauma-focused CBT model, and that's now a competency requirement for at two facilities, here at Cook Children's and our psychology department. Uh, we have six outpatient clinics, and all of our providers um, going forward are required to have that TFCBT training. And then also over at Lena Pope Home, their providers also have that training. And during this time, we did um, submit for another grant. We did not receive funding for that. Um, and yet we're moving forward. Um, Cooks is currently um, has a grant pending to provide some trauma-informed organizational assessment in two of our local homeless shelters. Cooks does a lot of work. Uh, there are three homeless shelters here in Tarrant County, and Cook provides basic medical and dental care in these clinics. So um, they are seen in a medical home. Uh, we actually have um, a grant that funded a uh, van that will go to the shelters, pick them up, take them to appointments. Um, and this is true for their mental health appointments as well as their physical help. And what we're looking to do this year is to really start with that core group of people and provide trauma-informed training to both the clinical and the non-clinical staff and our executives who are supporting this homeless mission. The other thing that we're really realizing in this work of trauma is that we really have to address the issue of compassion resilience. How do we retain this workforce um, and how do we provide support for that non-clinical staff? Uh, in 2013, we're also working, uh, Mental Health Connection is working to do a, a forum or a symposium on trauma for the broader community. And I guess finally I would summarize that we are also uh, engaging our um, juvenile justice system. We have identified um, children that are what we're calling crossover children. So these are children that have current cases in child welfare as well as juvenile justice. Uh, we have a local um, judge who's very interested in this, Judge Boyd, and we have two advocates, uh, one that um, works with CASA, which is our uh, court-appointed child advocates, 
and we're looking that group is looking um, to target children up to age six and it is bringing the TBRI um, research that um, Drs. Purvis and Dr. Cross are doing at TCU. This is the trust-based relational intervention. I think there's a typo on that, I apologize, um, at the TCU Child Development Center. And really looking at providing trauma education for CPS workers and attorneys, and really how to um, improve the treatment uh, for those folks. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. I appreciate your time and interest, and I will pass it back to our host. Thanks, Lena. That was really informative. Um, one of our comments in the chat room was that uh, Cook's Children is really doing an excellent job, and you just gave us a wonderful um, in-depth look at how uh, both the community up there and Cook's Children's is implementing trauma-informed uh, care. I had the pleasure uh, last February, I believe it was, to go up to uh, Mental Health Connections strategic planning session that was a two-day session uh, in which Mental Health Connections and so many, maybe 150 community partners, including DePelchin and others, uh, really laid out the course for uh, children's mental health and system of care uh, development over the next few years. And it was really interesting to see how trauma-informed care and practice uh, was woven through many of the uh, discussions and initiatives and strategies that were developed during that session over those two days. So. Um, interesting work that's being done in Tarrant County. And now um, our final presenter is Shalonda Brooks, and she's at the Pelchin Children's Center uh, in Houston. And Shalonda is going to give us an overview and um, some more specific information about what they're doing at DePelchin. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and transition to you. Um, Shalonda, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, so I want to talk more specifically about how some of these trauma event, um, interventions look in our organization. And so I'm first going to start by um, telling you a little bit about Depelchin and what we do in general. So we are an outpatient community center um, in Houston, Texas, and we offer um, several different services to our family, the families that come through our centers. So for example, we do counseling, and that includes individual therapy, family therapy, and group therapy. We're also very fortunate to have um, psychiatry in-house um, right here at our center. Um, we have licensed psychologists that provide um, comprehensive assessments. And then we also have a residential treatment center on staff and um, have programs that look at foster care and adoption. I also forgot to put on the slide, but we do um, have a training center um, at our main location. And so um, we're able to provide trainings to our clinicians and staff, um, but also to individuals out in the community. And then um, occasionally at times being able to provide psychoeducation classes. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of our different um, trauma-specific services and um, how they've been implemented in our organization. So, um, I'd like to speak about strengthening, strengthening family coping resources, parent-child interaction therapy, attachment, self-regulation, and competency framework, and psychological first aid. So first, I'm going to talk about strengthening family coping resources. Um, and we call this SSCR for, um, for short. Um, it was created by Laurel Kaiser, and it is a manualized treatment, and it's 15 weeks long, and it's a multifamily group for families that have been affected by trauma. So if anyone um, in the family has had a trauma experience or witnessed a trauma, um, they can come into our group. Um, what's really neat about it is it's appropriate for all types of families. Um, so we've had families come through that have experienced neglect or um, families where a parent or caregiver um, has been involved with substance use or um, physical abuse. And then we get um, your typical families where there's parents and children. We also get quite a few grandparents and other caregivers that come in. And then anyone that the family wants to be part of the group that they consider a primary um, support source um, is also welcome in our group. So we've had quite a diversity of the types of families that we've had here. 
Um, the goal of this program is to help families build upon their past um, and current resources so that they can better able to they're better able to cope with um, what's going on in their families um, currently. Um, and if they've had a long complex trauma history and, and haven't had very many um, coping resources um, in the past, we give them lots of tools um, to go forth through this program. So this is a skill-based program and it's modular in approach. And so each skill builds um, on the previous skill. Um, and it's rooted in empirically based um, treatments and has a lot of evidence and support through research um, on what kind of skills um, families that have experienced trauma need. So some of our skills include enhancing a sense of safety. So um, we do a safety map with families um, where they kind of draw out or plot out their neighborhood or areas near them and they each get to um, give an example or talk about whether they feel safe there and why not. And this is a, a pretty powerful um, piece in that lots of times um, different members of the family uh, don't know the comfort level of others um, um, in their physical surroundings. And then we also help them to build back up rituals and routines that may have been disrupted because of their trauma. And as part of that, we, we model that in our program. So things are always set up the same way in group. We have our own rituals and routines. So one of the first things we do on early sessions is establish, you know, what are we going to do for check-in? What are we going to do for check-out? And the families get to be a part of that. And so we model good routines and rituals. And then, of course, we work on things like improving their communication um, and emotional regulation, and then also things like relaxation training and problem solving. So the next couple of slides uh, is taken directly from the manual, and it just gives briefly some of the focus areas and some of the strategies or um, topics that we do within those areas, and then the goals and how it's been linked to um, empirically supported treatment. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what makes um, this program unique. Um, as some of the other presenters um, said earlier, it's really important in trauma to focus on the family as a whole. So instead of doing individual treatment or only on the child that um, has experienced the trauma, the whole family is there. So we can look at how it affected that child how it affects the family as a unit, but also how it's disrupted or affected relationships and interactions between um, family members. Also, this is a very interactive group. Um, there's a teaching component in the beginning, but then there are whole group activities, there's family activities, and breakout sessions. And we use a lot of play and games um, to teach these lessons, and so they get lots of practice. And in addition, um, they get homework nightly so that when they come back, um, they're working toward a goal and a mastery of a skill so we can move on to the next skill set. And then lastly, um, it's also a unique group because we take um, children of all ages. So infants up, it's not that like six to eight year olds or we have to do um, this age. It really, um, we want all family members that are affected to be there. And the breakout sessions work at the child's developmental level. So we may have an infant toddler group, we may have an early childhood group, a teen group, a parent group, as many um, different age ranges as it takes. Um, and in the manual, um, there are different activities for, for um, each age level so that um, we're working at um, on skills that are developmentally appropriate um, and they're all getting the same thing. Um, here at Depelchin, we've had four successful groups. Um, group size range from 7 to 15, um, around about. Um, what's really neat about the groups is that um, at the end of the groups, parents have found not just a support at Depelchin, but in each other. We learned that they start calling each other after groups, and they may even still keep in contact um, with each other um, after the groups have ended. Um, a lot of our clients that are in the groups are current clients um, in our system that are going through family therapy, but this group just provides them another service um, so that we can continue their care. 
and then this group the groups are open to members in the community so that's another good way to get individuals who may not have gotten treatment for trauma in the door and kind of a less threatening aspect so in a group setting versus individual or family work um, at the beginning of the group and at the end, we do pre and post measures. Um, for example, um, families may complete a CBCL, a TSCC, um, a sense of safety scale, and the F COPES, which looks at um, kind of their coping skills and a parent stress inventory. And we've seen lots of growth and changes by collecting these measures at the end. So um, our research is showing that the groups are effective and families are feeling more supported and are better functioning um, at the end of our groups. So next, I'm going to talk about um, parent-child interaction therapy, and this has come up a couple of times also in the slides, which was really nice to see. Um, so it was originally a behavior management program for children um, ages 2 to 7 that had disruptive um, behavior problems, so children that were diagnosed with um, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, or conduct disorder. Um, and although it started there, it really has um, branched out and is effective for um, lots of different populations um, of children. And it really was the early 90s when they began looking at PCIT um, and families that have um, a history of abuse. And particularly at that time, they were looking at um, physical abuse. So the thought was that if families have... Uh, Families have experienced physical abuse. There are, you know, coercive parenting cycles there, and so teaching parents skills to interrupt those coercive parenting cycles, and then also better ways to manage their child's behavior that doesn't include um, physical punishment um, that is excessive. So, um, what would make this appropriate for families with trauma? Well, we know that trauma interrupts daily functioning, and normal development, and interaction. And PCIT helps with that. There's routines in there. Um, parents are expected to do um, homework each night. So we're getting, again, um, some rituals back in there. And one of the main goals of the first part of PCIT, which is child-directed child interaction, is really to build a warm, positive relationship with the parent. So it helps build back up um, their relationships. And lots of times in families that have experience trauma, they may not experience very many positive feelings or have strange, strained relationships. And so that's a key piece in PCIT. We also know that traumatized children often display uh, disruptive behaviors. And the second half of the PCIT program, parent-directed interaction, addresses those. Um, and I've mentioned some of these things before. It's also very interactive. Um, and that we use a lot of play to help build up that relationship and we teach parents to use their praise and attention um, to change the child's behavior. Again, they're giving lots of different strategies and techniques to help manage disruptive behaviors. And then throughout the program, clinicians are modeling um, appropriate coping skills and we're teaching parents to model appropriate co coping skills also. Another nice thing about PCIT is although it is a manualized program, um, it's also a program that's based on mastery. So families continue the program until they've mastered the skills. Um, and then we also use a lot of data to make sure um, that they're getting where we want to be and that they're picking up the skills. So we are constantly reassessing um, at every session the child's behavior and also the parent's skills. So here at Depelchen, we've had many staff trainings. Um, where individuals learn PCIT. Um, most recently, we have um, been going through the official procedures with P um, PCIT International to have in-house trainers so that we can more formally um, be recognized from their website as providers and also be able to train individuals from the community. And then we've established a PCIT clinic, which is on Wednesdays. And so family, families know that um, this is going to happen every Wednesday. They have a set appointment time. It's also good for clinicians who are learning the model to be able to observe and come practice and, and, and see it put in place. And it also provides an opportunity for our practicum and intern students to learn the model with ha without having to go through the full training. Um, so we're continuing with staff trainings 
Um, but if staff aren't comfortable implementing, they can refer their client to our clinic and clinicians who um, are experts in that area uh, are more than happy to um, do the PCAT. Um, next, I'm going to talk about attachment, self-regulation, and competency framework. It's ARC for short, um, and it's a flexible framework for treating complex trauma in children um, and youth. And I just have their definition here for complex trauma. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with that, so I won't read it to you. Um, and the goals are help children feel safe and connected, so it builds up that attachment again that may be lost, again, that loss of positive relationships. Um, we work with parents and caregivers um, to model these appropriate behaviors. The goals are also for you to be able to recognize and express their feelings appropriately, as well as understanding the feelings of others, so we work on self-regulation. And then we, it teaches um, coping strategies that helps them deal with their surroundings and better gain an understanding of who they are. So that's the competency piece. Um, and there are 10 building blocks that um, focus on working toward the goals. Um, and again, although in general you would start at the bottom building block, it's flexible. So if a child isn't having attachment issues, you can go to a different block on, and work on a different area. Um, it also uses modeling with the caregiver uh, quite a bit, as well as the clinician. Um, what ARC allows you to do, because it's not manualized, is for clinicians to be able to look at a child from a trauma-informed lens, so recognizing how trauma disrupts normal development um, and understanding some of their current behaviors through a trauma focus, and also being able to work at um, the child's developmental level. So here at Depelchin, um, there have been a couple of trainings specifically for clinicians and counseling in our residential treatment center. Um, our residential treatment center houses about 30 youth, um, 12 and up, and um, was having quite a few problems. Um, it's a tough population to work with, um, but since um, the trainings there, um, staff um, are better able to think about some of the behaviors they're seeing, attention seeking, what need the, is the child trying to get met, um, understanding the hypervigilance, and then being able to approach it differently. And there's definitely been a de-escalation between staff and kids since then. And there's ongoing supervision between the staff there where they can talk about cases and present cases, and we look at it from an ARC framework. Um, we've also started trainings um, on ARC with our foster care and adoption programs, and our plans are by early 2013 to um, have ARC as an overarching framework in our organization. So um, for anyone that's going to come in contact with our kids, from our front desk staff to IT staff to facilities. And last, I'm going to talk a little bit about psychological first aid. Um, the purpose of that program is to assist families after disaster or act of terrorism. And this is meant to be a brief short-term intervention. So think of um, a triage situation when um, there might be a disaster like in a hospital or something like that. Um, and what's neat about psychological first aid is that it can be delivered by almost anyone that has the training and is useful in a variety um, of settings. So again, the principles are built upon empirical research, but they're not so rigid um, that they're not applicable in the field, and again, that um, a layperson can't um, administer it. And then also another good area, as others have pointed out, is that when we're doing these treatments, they do need to be developmentally appropriate and culturally sensitive. Um, they have There's eight core actions. And I'm not going to read through each of these, but it gives um, providers a way to approach an individual after a disaster. Um, so for example, most recently, if you were trained in PFA, um, individuals may have gotten a call to um, deploy to help with victims from Sandy. And you might be in a shelter or in a school setting if there was a school emergency. And it goes to these principles of how to triage, find out who's most distressed, approach them, find out what they need, um, and going through these other areas as appropriate. It's meant to be very flexible and fluid and to really work at the need of the individual. 
Um, already talked a little bit about what makes it unique. Again, it's brief, it's short term, it's a triage program. Um, you can move through any of those core beliefs depending on um, what the client needs, and it can be delivered by almost anyone. And another neat part about it is it does provide triage, but some of the other points that um, you may have seen focus on setting them up with long-term support. So how we've used it here at Depelchin is we've um, open house had community trainings. Um, in those, we've had clinicians, we've had um, police officers, we've had nurses, we've had some people who are just interested in volunteering. And so they get to learn about trauma and how it may affect others, how to recognize it, and then how to implement the techniques. And then we've also trained several clinicians um, or many clinicians in-house. So again, that was just a brief overview of some of the things we're doing here at Depelchin to be trauma-informed. Some of the other things that I didn't mention is that um, we always try to keep on our trauma glasses or our trauma lens, and so our intake procedures always assess for trauma. Uh, most recently, we were part of a developmental trauma um, disabilities trial study um, to look at how trauma affects children more specifically, um, and then also for um, thinking about the way that we then diagnose trauma in children. So I have up um, our website information. Um, it also has a list of all the services that Depelchin um, offers as well as our phone number and then my contact information if anyone else is interested in how we've implemented these here or just how to get a hold of these resources. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Uh, that was really an amazing presentation and so informative to see how Depelchin has translated the principles and practices of trauma-informed care into those specific programs. Um, found ourselves, you know, thinking about uh, the broad array of applications uh, today. I think this has been a wonderful um, introduction and uh, a great opportunity to look at the uh, overview of trauma-informed care at multiple levels. This is concluding our webinar today. I want to remind you uh, to please complete the evaluation. If you look in the chat box, there are some specific instructions around how to access that. It will appear in your web browser following the completion of the webinar, and you can also access it at the link uh, that's provided there in the chat room. Also, I remind you that uh, all the contents and uh, the content of this webinar will be available at the Texas System of Care website in about two weeks for download. And you are invited to uh, invite others to share that and to uh, learn from our webinar series. And please keep uh, aware uh, through our website of additional um, opportunities, learning opportunities that will be coming up in the future. Again. Thank you for your participation today.